uh, my name is Alar and I am the compositing tutor here at the Scape. Um, not the compositing tutor, uh, the, a, a compositing tutor. There's, there's quite a few of us and um, and I'd like to think that we are all really, really good. Um, so basically we have been doing uh, compositing um, ourselves, uh, the tutors here for, for years and years. We've, we've all worked in the industry and we've seen it develop as well. So so next week, for example, um, at the same time, uh, five o'clock, there will be another session with uh, two other tutors of ours, uh, Socrates and um, and Claudia. And they, for example, will tell you about um, compositing in television. So looking at, um, and they will show you some of their work, which is pretty intense and impressive. Um, and um, and basically, uh, they will kind of look at the uh, TV uh, in particular. So we kind of all, when we think about visual effects, we think of the the grandest, biggest films, but uh, but actually visual effects is so prevalent everywhere. And with these days, especially with things like Netflix, uh, Prime, Hulu, Disney Plus, um, that you know pe people don't really get to go to cinemas that that much anymore, uh, and they want more content at home. So so the so the need for kind of you know getting getting visual effects. Um, at home is 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 massive. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about today, um, this is a fairly uh, video heavy um, um, presentation. But basically, what I just kind of want to show you is um, is the, the 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 compositing side of things. Um, so so this week or this month we're kind of talking about compositing in general and, um, and what I wanted to kind of do here to start off this 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 four four episode webinar series is just to kind of give a good introduction to to what compositing is um, a little bit about its history and then and sort of where does it live live in in, in the modern modern world of, of visual effects um, so let's do the history part first um, that's only briefly, um, and then, then we'll kind of look at some examples of um, that. Hopefully, on, should make you make it easier for you to understand what compositing really is about, um, and uh, and what makes it so exciting for us, and and how how come yeah you can do exciting stuff and and then make a career out of it and then earn a living. So it's like great. It's like I can do cool stuff and and earn a living. Yay! Um, so first of all. Um, just uh, to really, really take us, you know, really, 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 really early into the into the history of film, um, because people often, you know, say things such as, uh, you know, you can't really watch modern blockbusters because it's all so full of VFX and um, as if visual effects is something new, um, and then there's compositing and then you know these these kind of things are are something new. But actually, if you look at really, 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 really old uh, film artists, such as the really early um, pioneer George Méliès, I picked three films um, from from his list of over five hundred films that he made, all short films, but still, um, he was very much into into using visual effects to to help to tell a story. In some places, it was for sort of comedic purposes. In some cases, it was for all the other purposes, uh, where um, you do things with film that you couldn't do in real life, so so the, so the so the idea of of, of doing something um, that that you that you cannot do in reality to to, to, to be able to tell the stories that that um, that um, you know that that don't actually happen in reality. You know that's that that's always been there in the history of film. So uh, the, the example I'm going to show you is the is, is the one man one man band. And uh, this was made in 19, um, 1900, um, which is really a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's more than 100 years, it's 120 years ago. And uh, uh, basically what it sort of illustrates is uh, something that's very, very similar to, to actually the modern compositing techniques, whereby you take multiple clips, uh, 
or multiple elements of, of a video, uh, in, in his case, it was film, and, uh, and you put them together, you compose them together to make this composite image, which then you can use to, to kind of tell some kind of a new story. Um, so here, you know, just, just, this, just this very clever, clever approach. Uh, the way that he did it is he, he double exposed his film, so he did, tried not to move his camera uh, between takes and then um, just, uh, just expose it again uh, with himself in a, in a, in a new position. Um, and um, and uh, you know, that, that, that creates a, a duplicate of him. But, uh, but really, you know, why, why this thing is so impressive is, you know, this is 120 years ago, the storytelling, the history of film from the beginning has always been visual effects. So, um, you know, there's also non-visual effects and, and part of this side of things of wanting to do things in camera, there are directors that still try to do that as much as possible and try to use sort of non-visual effects techniques uh, by doing special effects. So for example, Chris Nolan and, and his recent film Tenet uh, try to use editing and practical effects as much as possible. Um, so he says like he only has about 300 shots in his, um, in that movie, which uh, 300 VFX shots, which is similar to what these days would be in a rom-com. Um, but, um, but, but it's, uh, it's, you know, in some ways it's like, so what? <laughs> We're still trying to tell story and you know talk about the sci-fi. You know, who who cares how you got to that technique, uh, Mr. Nolan? Um, anyways, um, so as the technology developed further, I'm skipping half a century of, of techno technological developments in here. Um, we uh, sort of a very common device uh, to create visual effects was something called an optical printer. So basically. It's a film projector and the camera combined into one. And you have sort of multiple, so you have a projector in one end and then the camera in another end, and you have multiple reels of film going through this. And together these films uh, allow you to kind of expose different sections onto the film to be, uh, onto each other. Um, this is, um, uh, this image by the way is taken from this um, amazing book that uh, is called uh, special effects. I'm showing it to my camera. I don't know if anyone can see here, but, uh, but basically here it is. Um, and um, um, this book, even though it's called special effects, mostly talks about visual effects. Uh, special effects really, uh, if, you, if you talk about the terminology, uh, special effects stands for these uh, practical type of things. So like blood squibs on set, um, doing explosions on set, everything that you film in camera. And that actually happens, you know, for real. Um, even if it's fake or like you put a miniature in front of something big, but if you film it from that angle, it looks like it's a big thing. Um, so that's really special effects. Um, most of this book really is visual effects. And, and this, um, the Oscars a long time ago, they used to be called special and visual effects uh, to, to kind of allow for both. I don't remember what they call these days. I think it might still be the case, um, but anyways, so inside of this um, gargantuan optical um, printing machine, what you have is these multiple layers of um, film. So what you could have is the, a spaceship in one of them, uh, potentially shot uh, on a blue screen or something like that. Could be a miniature, could be, could be uh, probably a miniature. Um, and you have some kind of a background. So, so footage to shot, shot outside and then you have a mat which um, uh, would allow you to, to sort of composite them together. And effectively, when this mat is white, that's where we say this is where the foreground is. Um, and where it is black, that's where we should see the background. And in this process, uh, in this film um, compositing technique, you also make an inverse of this mat where it's white where you should see the background and black where you should see the foreground uh, or opaque in, in, in that case. Um, and, uh, and then what this allows you to do is this allows you to, um, by having these four and, and really one of them is this kind of, a, you know, it's, it's an inverse of an, another, by having three of these elements, a matte um, foreground and background, you can composite them together. And actually this, 
is still how we do it in compositing today except we do it in computers um, so we have two images that come in um, a map that tells you where is the foreground where is the background and that allows you to composite them together so techno technically speaking i have just explained to you compositing uh, but we have still still some time left for our um, webinar so i'm going to tell a little bit more um, so um, this isn't going to be a technical talk, by the way. Um, this, this, this was pretty much, you know, the technical part uh, concluded. So now, how do we get those maps in, in, in modern, modern day, modern day examples? So one way to do this is using rotoscoping. So here we have a um, clip of Tim. Uh, he's one of our uh, past students, and this is this is his showreel, and it demonstrates what. Um, what these mats actually look like. So here uh, we have colored the sky blue just to show how accurately he has made this map. And, um, and uh, this is basically a hand-drawn map. Um, if you think about this, and if you look at this kind of you know, black and white image here, this is what, uh, what Tim actually drew uh, using, using a mixture of digital softwares. The common one for that is, is Silhouette VFX. Um, and, uh, and it's an art form. Uh, people have written books about it. Um, there, there's a guy called um, uh, Benjamin Pratt, uh, works at ILM, well, a few years ago, he was in London at least. Um, he's, not, he's, not, he's not English, I think, but, uh, but at, at least a few years ago, he was in, in London and um, he supervised some of my some of my graduates as, as their rotor supervisor, but he's written a whole book about composite um, rotoscoping. And the way that rotoscoping works is what you actually do underneath is you draw little shapes. So rather than drawing an outline across the whole image, you draw small shapes and you learn the principles of animation to recreate the exact outline of the, of the object in front of you. So you draw small shapes and you move them frame by frame um, and then use multiple techniques, including tracking and um, motion. And, um, and um, it is, as you can imagine, a fairly time consuming um, job. But uh, what I've always found when, when I have to do rotoscopy is it is also a little bit zen. You, you kind of feel that um, it's a very clear goal. Go to work, um, you know exactly what you need to do. There's no, there's no two questions. If 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 there's a good good edge, then then you've done a good job. Um, so so you know you can put on your headphones, listen to music, um, and um, and what I really find satisfying as well is that while I'm working on these things, I'm looking at kind of small part of a leg and trying to kind of find that edge over there. But every now and again, I look at this, the mat itself that comes out of it, this black and white image, and. Uh, my wife, she's, she's an animator and, and she makes she makes 2D animations. Whereas what, what I can do is I can draw silhouettes that move like real people. You know, simply I'm actually tracing them. But but when I look at this kind of map itself afterwards, like I drew this, you know, I, I can do this. Well, this wasn't me, this was Tim. Uh, it was one of my students who did this. But uh, but but this, this kind of creation is like, I didn't know that I can draw this well. I didn't know I can draw the silhouette of a person this well and actually animate it and make it move frame by frame. Um, but we can, and 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 you know, it's 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 a mixture of basically perseverance and and using the best techniques uh, to to do it. But uh, but this is this is um, this is out of rotoscoping. So what rotoscoping allows you to do in this given cases um, it allows you to make a map. Um, and like I showed you in this previous image, uh, these maps can then be used later to combine different images together. In this given case, um, Tim hasn't done it. Tim has just shown it that he can combine uh, this other course mate of his with a gray background, uh, which is still a new background. Um, but also that's, that's the way we as compositors try to present our work. We try to be very open about it, try not to kind of hide any of our mistakes. So if it, you know, we can make sure that we get every single little detail in there. So, so attention to detail is, um, is, um, is, is, is what, uh, what compositors are, are good at. So here's another example of rotoscoping, uh, this time with a little bit of um, 
an example as well of, of why we might actually put, put, you know, how we might actually use this. So in this case, um, let's look at this. Um, Andres, another one of my graduates, um, he has cut out all the people from the front. So he has made a mat for all the people in the front. Then he has created this whole background, made brand new water, made brand new um, reflections on the water, made, made trees and all of that. Uh, for this new background plate, and because he has cut out all these people, he can put them back on top. And, um, and this is incredible because basically what you start with is you start with a footage that has two rowing boats, but you end up with a footage that has one. Um, and, and so this here is an example of, of how could we take one of these mats and actually put it to practice. Um, so we, we need this, um, this mat in order to put these people back on top of this, this new background there. Moving on. Keying. Keying is the, um, quite often or most commonly if people know anything about visual effects at all or have heard anything about visual effects or they think about visual effects is, uh, is that the stuff that we, you do with green screens, right? Um, and yes, yes it is. Um, so green screens um, uh, we can use um, in the following fashion. In effect, um, if you film someone in front of a green screen, um, like we did here, um, this was in the breakout space at Escape, we just uh, took a piece of, piece of uh, good quality green cloth um, and, um, and we filmed um, Tyler, who is, who is working somewhere in South Africa in one of the VFX companies now. Um, and we filmed her just sitting, sitting, sitting there, looking out in the distance. And then um, Evelyn, one of her other uh, compositing master students, um, she put her sitting on top of this um, edge of the building. And um, you know why would you why would you need to do this? Well, this again, considering film as a kind of practical. Um, venture, you know, there is money involved. Uh, if you really want to shoot these things for real, um, there are ways to do this in film as well. So the way that you would do this if you wanted to shoot this for real is you would fake it. You would try to build a small platform underneath um, this uh, this area over there, and you would have to get uh, permission to, you know, go to the building and and film there <laughs> and um, and the insurance involved in, in this is, is, is difficult. You, you have to do a lot of risk assessment. So, and these days, now that we're in lockdown, shooting on a real set is also more difficult. I have been on a real set very recently um, on, a, on a collaboration with a different film, uh, film academy in UK. Um, and it is hard because uh, you know you have to maintain social distancing. There's masks involved. Uh, there's only that many people you can actually have on the set. Um, so the part that could we film actors in a safe environment, um, such as for in, in front of a green screen, that's actually something that is probably going to be quite tempting to quite a lot of the productions now as well. There's something else called virtual production, and that people might be wondering about. But we we'll leave that for later, but this is a classic technique. So effectively, again, how it actually works is you, you tell the computer, um, look at everything that's green. If it's green, then it's probably background. If it's not green, then it's probably foreground and something I would like to keep. Um, so let's look at an example of that in here from another shot. So here we have um, Whitney. Um, standing in the wind and Katla, uh, who if I remember correctly works works in Sweden, I forget. Um, she's from Iceland but uh, works works somewhere in Scandinavia. So she she used this keying technique uh, to take this plate that we originally shot and uh, to extract this mat for um, for uh, Whitney, 
And uh, the real challenge in this is telling the computer what shade of green is the background, what shade of green is not background. If you actually look at this, this is there's a lot of lot of lot of different green colors in there. And if you look at the, the hair, um, when the hair is moving really fast, it is actually semi-transparent. So if, 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 if you really were to look at and zoom into that part of the picture in there, you wouldn't be able to really tell if this is just another shade of green or if this is hair. So, so this is where we need artists because the, for the computer, that green looks the same as, as this green over there. The computer doesn't know that this is, this is a person over there. Um, so, we, so we need someone who's an artist to, 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 to be able to judge uh, the, you know, pushing the dials and then making sure that, you know, we as a human, I know that this is hair, so I know that I need to get, get this detail back. Um, so extracting this, this level of detail so that um, when, you, when you actually get your map, um, that uh, this has the same amount of detail. You have all the kind of frizziness of this hair, all these tiny, tiny hair details there. Being able to extract that, that's, that's, that's kind of what makes a good artist. And again, it allows us to to, to take people and then put them in, in brand new environments. Um, this environment here um, is actually completely made in comp as well. Um, this is um, using a picture of a sky, uh, the, the rooftop we got from another video, but we had to, we had to replace it because the video, the angle didn't work because the, what, what we have in the foreground in the green screen, this is a moving video. So our camera didn't move the same way. So we had to take away the movement from the background video and recreate that movement uh, to make it move the same way as, as our video does. And uh, part of this then meant that we had to also fake this water in here. Um, and, and you notice this water here has reflections. It's also reflecting the, reflecting the lightning bolt um so and this reflection just has a little bit of um, um ripples so all this is is um is compositing it's um uh, and you get to put your artistic artistic um work into this there's a it it was up up to up to to Cutler to kind of make this shot into in, in you know to have this background to put this lightning bolt there this is this all you, you have the full control or what ends up in your image. One of our other tutors here um, compares um, compositing to Photoshop. You have control over all of it. You have final control, you have final technical control, you have final artistic control. Um, and, and in the end, you, you want to make things that look good. So all the color choices in here, if you start from a footage that's just green, you have to kind of imagine what is it going to look like when we when we actually put this together, so what's the color tone on this? You know, how do we where do we want the lighting to work? So you control all of this. So we've spoken about rotoscoping and we've spoken about keying, and they're both kind of the, they are the in its simple form they're the art of making a mat, but um, but keying as well is is also the art of actually then putting it together, uh, because if you just make a mat. Um, in the real world, there's also green light bouncing onto her. So you can see, you can see here the jacket actually looks quite different uh, before and after. So there's all the all the part of putting it together as well. Neat. Paint and prep. So in every movie, things happen on the set that you didn't want to happen, um, or you, you you don't have control over all of the things. So for example, in this example here, maybe with what we had is, um, is a horse carriage that we were able to hire for a film, but uh, for legal reasons, we have to have the slow vehicle sign on it um, when, when you move it around. And then there's some other, other plastic bits there that should not really be there. Um, or if you imagine a film set uh, where you go to and there is someone who has parked a car and they're not there so you can't ask them to move the car but you need the shot so you shoot from that angle anyway and you leave that car in there or um when i was well, i was in the film set uh, just 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 um, two weeks ago 
you're filming in a forest. And, um, and even though we have uh, runners running around kind of clearing the perimeter, so because it's a public forest, uh, it has paths walking through it, people walk the dogs. So whenever we try to film something, we try to tell people, can you, can you give us 10 seconds while we take this take? Um, and not walk into the shot, but sometimes people are really, really far away and they walk to the back of the shot anyway. There are all these things that are beyond your control. Um, so in compositing, we can fix that. We can fix anything. It's time consuming and it costs money, money that we will be happy to take um, from, um, from the directors and the producers um, if, if they want to change it. Um, but, um, but, uh, but we can, we can fix, fix any of it. So in this example here, if we can see this uh, horse carriage, you just initially look at it, looks like a normal horse carriage, but then you look at it, it actually had all those other elements in there. And the part of taking them out is easy. You just take them out. But the challenging part is recreating what was originally meant to be behind them. So again, here, um, Andres, one of my, my graduates, um, has taken bits of the existing footage, like another wheel from the front and moved it to the back and rotated it a little bit. Uh, some of it he has just drawn himself and recreated the whole underside of this carriage. And at the top, just, just for experiment's sake, has, has done a little bit of green screen to add a guy in there. And he removed this other horse as well, because maybe, maybe in this shot, uh, this carriage was meant to be on its own. So to me, when, when I first, um, first sort of realized that, uh, that, that visual effects is actually what I want to do is, is when I went to an open day in, um, in a different uh, film institution. Um, and they, they, they showed me just, just these kind of things. Um, like literally, they can make people disappear. You can make the people disappear, um, as ominous as it sounds. Um, but, uh, but you start with footage and you transform this footage, you take something out and no one will be able to tell the difference. Because we can make it, we can do Photoshop work on moving images. Um, so, so there is, you know, the, 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 the power. <laughs> Imagine what you could do with this, um, taking things out. Um, so, so this is something that we, 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 we can do. And, um, and it's, 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 it's uh, you know, th th this here is coursework from, from Escape as well. So, so that's, that's the kind of quality that you kind of expect if, if you were to, for example, come and study with us. Um, but, um, but this happens in every film, every single film. Um, we'll have some of these kind of things uh, that, that we'll need, re you know, removing. If you have animals on set, uh, usually the wrangler will have like a, like a rope that uh, keeps the animal there just in case they, or something that animals can do. Um, if you if you are shooting period drama, there's going to be lamp posts, uh, trash cans, things that did not exist in that particular period. Uh, the windows will be wrong. The windows will be plastic, and you need them to be old wooden ones. Uh, all these things is is what what compositors can can do and fix. Um, and uh, this is something that happens in every movie. Not every movie needs big explosions, not every movie needs spaceships, but every movie needs touch-ups. Um, a more recent thing, so this is a very recent um, uh, assignment submission from one of my students. Um, she hasn't even got her mark yet, um, but uh, you can judge, judge yourself whether she's done a good job or not. But one of the very recent things that we've seen in the movies is making people look younger or older or better or worse. Um, digital makeup and retouching. Um, I have done a fair bit of that in, in my day as well. I used to I used to work in commercials. So so one of the commercials that I did actually I think got pulled because we <laughs> they for for a, for a makeup commercial um, the whatever government agency gets to decide these things they decided that the amount of digital work was too much um, that we had added. Um, nevertheless, it still happens in every movie and it happens way more often than you think it does. So this is kind of an extreme example here. We have a lady and um, we made her look uh, younger. Um, 
and um, and and you might think about films like um, uh, the one with Will Smith recently. Uh, I forget its name, Gemini Man, uh, or Irish Man with uh, Robert De Niro. Um, they sort of write papers about it and they kind of you know explain the new technology uh, of, of how they how they try to try to make people younger you know using computers but most of it is actually compositing most of it is sort of um, similar to this paintwork that we just saw in this kind of previous shot with uh, with the horse carriage it's about the artists and and this is one thing that my student did really well for this, for this project as well they really researched into how people actually age. So if we play this clip a little bit forward and see the original, um, so you can see the comparison of what, what, what we actually started with. So this is what we started from. And, um, and after doing a little bit of the aging, this, this is what we, what we get to now. Um, so, the, so the technique there is, is, is not just about smoothing the skin or getting rid of the wrinkles. There's so much else that goes into the aging process um, due to the um, loss of collagen in the skin. So, so, so gravity begins to affect, affect the face. Um, uh, eyelids look different. Our noses keep growing until the end of our life, which is why old men have bigger noses and bigger ears. Uh, so there's all these other parts of, of um, age um that that comes comes through our faces and and it's not just one direction and like i said before this happens a lot more than people think um it, it, it's only when you kind of do quite drastic changes such as uh, michael douglas in ant-man or something like that you know there's we show him in you know now we show him in the 70s so of course you know he looked different but a lot of the times if you have an actress in the movie or an actor in the movie we still make them look a little bit, a little bit better, um, and it's cool because you know again it's, it's Photoshop work. Uh, we, we get to put this all this all this stuff together. So CG compositing. Eventually, we would like to actually see some kind of you know big big explosions and robots shooting things as well. Again, we get to do that. Um, it will be the three D department that will model these things and the three D department that will. You know, create them and animate them, or the animation department in that case. But it is the compositors who take it in the end and put it together into the shot. Um, so you still have the full control over everything. So the actual shooting part in here as well, this is kind of effect, the kind of glowing, all of this. So, you know, that um, in, in the given case, that's 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 pure comp. Um, and uh, and as compositors, you have the full artistic control. So if you want to put some sparks in here. You do that, you know, and and, and you know, you, you go to the director. It's like I think this shot would be better if, if that was in there as well. The director would be like, "Great, let's do it for all the shots." And the producer would be like, "No, that's you know a lot more work." But nevertheless, you still can really impact what what is the final thing that the person in the cinema is going to see. It's your shot, you put it together, so you feel the real ownership. Um, of the shot when you're the compositor. Um, other artists, they make elements for you. You take them and you put them together. So, so here's an example of that. There's a robot going pew pew. And uh, just an example of how, how all of this you know, comes, comes together. Um, so cheesy elements in the, in the front, but, but all of this niceness, everything, you know, the, the stuff that actually makes it look cool in the end. You know, this, this, this last few wipes in here, this, that's, that's, that's compositing. Um, beyond that, there is one more step, which is grading and finishing. Um, but these days, more and more of that is happening in comp as well. Um, so, one more. Digital matte painting. Now, environment art is actually something that is somewhere in between compositing and 3D because um, in big companies such as ILM and MPC, you have a separate department called um, environments. And what they do is they, they have skill sets uh, from 3D and, and 2D as well. Um, and what they do is, is you know, basically they can create brand new worlds 
so in the given case in here uh, this is for a for a student film earlier this year we did not have the opportunity um well the budget to to go to guatemala and to shoot some some ancient aztec pyramids so the plan was to try to make it ourselves um and uh, we had 3d making some of the some of the uh, plants and things in the foreground also some of the ones in the background but then it's the compositing that actually puts it all together um so some of the uh, plants in the background some of the trees they are um they are from uh, from a painting so some of it is 3d some of it is 3d but we rendered only one frame and then we add the movement afterwards in comp a bit dark so it's a bit hard to see um but again in the end you know this 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 final touches here you, you sort of put everything together yourself and it you know it looks looks okay but then you start playing with the lighting you start playing with the with the, with the actual work of this of actually kind of making it make, making it cool so in the end in the, in the compositing you have the you have the final final control over what things look like um so finishing we take everything and we put it together so that this this is sort of the the final final work that we do we 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 get to decide what things look like in then there are there, you know there are all the manual processes in there it starts from cutting things out but in then you kind of get to really create um that the final shot you 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 control over this you 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 have the photoshop but for moving images so uh, let me just think if i have any, any quick good examples for this uh, i'll just quickly show you a few more in here um we've looked at more of the, most of them already um i just might want to show you um just one or two more um so here's another nice breakdown um of this robot running um so 3d gives us the robot they make the robot uh, but we create everything else and you look at this and it's like okay you know we, we put the robot into the shot but what else is there uh, but then we start breaking it down and actually we have created quite a lot we have created the whole right side of this image um we've created this whole world on the right side this um, house now is in a much nicer environment um earlier when i was talking about keying um it was referring to green screen and um and cutting out people or making a mat for them you can also use keying to replace the sky because you can tell the computer that the sky in our given image is brighter than the trees so let's put these trees on top of a new image which will be a new sky a cooler one a nicer one and again as a compositor you get to put all of this together and and make it look cool so so if you start with the separate elements and you create this world so there's matte painting in there um you take the cg you do tiny small things such as um you you get rid of like the tripod that was accidentally on the set you didn't didn't even notice that it was there while we were shooting but afterwards you come to set the clips but all this integration giving it a shadow giving it giving it some elements of mud that kind of kick off uh, making it motion blurred so it so it looks like it's actually been filmed with the same camera this is this is what um what compositors do and um and what we are kind of really really all all about um show you this one as well um it's another shot from this other movie um again just just showing um the art of art of finishing and keying as well um again did not have the um opportunity to really take the character to do a um aztec uh, pyramid so we took him to the basement uh, for those who have been to escape you will recognize b42 um so that's 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 the room in there this is a little portable green screen that that we set up and we filmed it with a really really long lens uh, to get the same same view as it would be in the in, in this kind of real world um and we got him out and you don't even need that much screen screen you only need green screen that's big enough to to be behind the person everything else is relevant we can we can easily remove that um so we take this person we create a cg background and we start putting it together we put those plants in there 
Uh, we put elements, we put light rays, we put little bugs that fly around. And as a compositor, you, you put a little bit, of, little bit of smoke and fog in there. All of this to kind of give this interaction, to, to give this feeling that, you know, this is, that he's actually there. He's actually in Guatemala, but he's not. He's in, he's, he's in, our, in our building basement. Um, and, um, and yeah, this is, this is kind, of, kind of what we do. What kind of softwares do we use for this kind of stuff? Um, there's um, there's Nuke, Flame, Fusion, Mocha, and Silhouette. Um, Nuke is what the industry uses and what we teach here as well. Um, it's expensive um, if you buy the production license. It's affordable for a VFX artist if you buy the indie license. But it has an education license and it has non-commercial version as well. So if you want to start playing with compositing tonight, you can start um, start right now. Um, another one which we don't teach, um, but uh, some of our tutors have extensive experience in that, is Flame. Flame historically um, has mostly been a compositing and finishing tool. So most commercials still these days as well actually go through Flame as well. So if you have a short piece, such a commercial, and you want to add these looks to all these shots, you really want one person to do it for all the shots to make it all consistent. And, and, and you want the director's input there as well because the, you know, the, the, the client is there. They want to see that, make sure that their product is actually really you know, visible. So, so then, you, then you kind of do it, do all the shots at the same time so this is something that Flame does. Fusion is another one which um, has had over a thousand Hollywood movies uh, made by it. Um, and um, they are really, really affordable. Fusion comes in another software package called Blackmagic Resolve. Um, and uh, it also has a free version. And the free version is very capable. So you can do a lot of things with the free version. So if you want to again learn compositing, and and kind of start to start learning tonight, I really strongly recommend learning Fusion as well. Um, some of our tutors are are authorized Fusion trainers as well. So so one day, one day, you know, just keep checking in. Maybe maybe one day we'll we'll teach you Fusion too. And finally, Mocha and Silhouette, they are used for planar tracking and and rotoscoping, so this 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 one in here, cutting these people out. Um, so they are owned by Boris FX, and um, which is a relatively recent development. So um, over the past few years, Boris FX has bought them, and um, and they turned them into plugins. So if you have something like Nuke or Fusion, you can get a plugin uh, for doing the planar tracking and rotoscoping in there, and. Um, um, I think if you ask nicely, um, they definitely have given education license to people, um, but uh, but you you'll find also occasionally if you see some cool cool work, they attribute and say thank you for the people of um, Imagineer Systems back in the days. Um, so these are the kind of software packages that you that you probably want to want to look into after after this webinar. So. This is everything I kind of wanted to say. I just wanted to show you. I just wanted to show you my Chrome, which is already open. Shift that. So I'm going to escape. Um, so I wanted to show you first of all this website, um, and hopefully uh, Derek will pop it into the chat box as well. Um, so so this is a, a little bit about a special website that we just re recently made last week or the week before, um, to kind of tell you a little bit more about what compositing is and what events for compositing we have coming coming up. So for example, uh, next week we have Socrates and, uh, and, and Claudia talking about compositing in, in TV. Um, then I will be doing a, a, a fairly specialist, um, kind of a technical uh, tutorial uh, for if, you, if, you're, if you're already really good at compositing, and want to show, kind of, you know, learn something really new. Um, I will show you some some kind of quite cool tricks um, that you can do you can do in comp. Um, so even if you're if you're you know, relatively senior artist, uh, I recommend 
coming to this one as well. Um, you know, that's just to kind of see and learn something new. And um, and we have another one about the key skills that a composite artist will need. Um, so not not only the technical and artistic skills, but 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 wider. Um, uh, Claudia also has um, has written a book about uh, how to survive in visual effects in the past. So uh, you're welcome to read that. And I want to finish this talk with uh, the showreel of what we at the Scape Studios did um, in this uh, spring term um, after we went to lockdown. So we were able to film some of the student projects um, in February, like a few weeks just before the lockdown. Um, but then all this work on this showreel here, this was completed during lockdown um, between between March and uh, end of May. Um, so, so just to kind of show you, show you the stuff, stuff that uh, the kind of work that we do here as well. Um, and another thing to note as well, everything that I showed you earlier in these slides, all that work, um, this is all, um, it's professional work because that's the output of, 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 of our students here when they, when they graduate, but it's all our student work. Um, and it's, it's, it's all the work that they either did as, as part of the course coursework or or assignments. So yeah, uh, so enjoy enjoy this reel. If you have any questions, um, I'll happily answer them. So yeah, any any questions? I will also stop sharing. Um, so I can see one question here. Um, so someone has asked, um, how essential are drawing skills in compositing work? Um, that's a good work. Uh, good, good question. Um, they're not totally essential, but they can be very, very, very helpful. Um, so for example, uh, this thing here, if you can see it, uh, this, thing is a, this thing is a Wacom pen. So, so I use this instead of a mouse. Um, um, so that's, that's, that's the tablet, tablet that I use for that. Um, and, um, and it does, does help. So especially when you get to the part of um, the, 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 the uh, paint and prep and, and, and making kind of photo real paintings effectively, um, then, then it, can be, it can be very helpful. But at the same time, um, it, if you're dealing with this sort of photo prep type of stuff, you are looking at the, at the really, really kind of small part, small part of your image. And it's, it's, it's not even about, you know, the, the drawing skills at that stage is, is the, it's about the learning to develop the eye to tell is what I have created, is it real or not? Or do I need to keep working on it? 
and just keep working on it. And, and you do this really small thing and and you just compare it with another real thing next to it. And it's like, you know, does, does this wheel on this horse carriage, does it look real? Well, if I compare it to the other one, the other one has some kind of highlights over there. Maybe I need to have, add a few highlights here as well. So, so it's not essential in the sense that you, you can do it very deductively as well. You can just, just look at the image and, and, and just make it, make it real. Um, where it can be helpful is um, more on the digital matte painting side of things. Um, in, in that case, um, you, when you're making brand new worlds, um, then, then you need a little bit of this kind of drawing uh, creativity style of approach of how to create ideas by doing rough sketches first and then develop them into kind of final images. Um, so in that case, yes, you know, going from concept art to, to a final, final matte painting. Um, I'm not that good at that part. Um, um, I'm, I'm a bit more on the technical side of things. I can, I can make things for the real. I can make you know, things look cool as well. Um, my, my trick for making things look cool is, uh, is again, look at referencing. Um, um, like, you know, just uh, it's like, what else do you think looks cool? Can you do the same thing? Cool. Um, so a few questions in here. So what do I think about working from home? The big studios will migrate for this kind of relationship with an artist. Uh, yes, uh, some of the artists that you actually saw um, in the in the videos there, um, they they are still working from home, um, and I know quite a few of the places that uh, that are still working from home. Um, and um, uh, the trick for that is is you use um, VPN, so virtual private networks, and RGS, which is remote graphics software. Uh, which we use at Escape as well, and that's how we deliver our full-time courses, whereby you log into another computer that's actually somewhere else. Um, so early today, uh, I did a taste today. I'm doing another one, I think, in November. So if you like what you saw and you want to actually try what it feels like to kind of, what kind of material do we actually cover in the composition course itself, do another taste today. We have another one coming up in November at some point. Uh, and in that one, I kind of show as well, just as quickly, um, like what the difference is between using Nuke in my own machine here and and in the machine that's actually somewhere else. It's effectively the same. Uh, modern days, if you can stream Netflix at home, then you can also stream a different computer screen to your home as well. Um, uh, so, so will the big studios migrate for this kind of st stuff? Uh, probably, to, 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 to a large extent, I think. Um, that, 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 that there is another thing, which is some of the very, very big studios, um, Disney and Pixar, for example, they, um, they have been, um, um, they have been, um, in the past, they've been very, very, very particular about, you know, people not taking phones into the studio so that, you know, no one would take the next picture of this next Star Wars movie. So these days they're trying to kind of figure out how do they, um, how could you tell of someone's spouse <laughs> what if they took a picture of you know you working from home? But but that's that's for them to figure out. Um, technically, yes, a lot of my friends are, are working from home. Um, so yeah. So a few two other questions, um, uh, or you know we'll, we'll do to a few of them. So um, what's the difference between two D and three D compositing? Uh, excellent question. Um, so not particularly visible in, in, in these examples here, but actually I might just uh, quickly jump into, into one of these ones in here. So 2D compositing effectively uh, refers to, you know, the, the, the part of, of dealing with, the, with just the picture, you know, just the pixels in the picture, you use them to create a map or something like that. Um, whereas 3D compositing is more visible. So for example, this uh, paint and prep, this horse carriage, it's effectively 2D compositing. It's just using patches that we have moved in, in 2D space uh, into the right place and, and animated them until they look real. Uh, so this is effectively pure 2D compositing. 3D compositing is more this, uh, this digital matte painting type of things and also this uh, robot shop in here as well, where in the end, uh, we create this environment at the back. Some of this is 3D elements some of this is pictures in 2D, 
um, um, then um, then yeah, that's that's sort of what what we would call the three D uh, VFX. Uh, so another question here about uh, After Effects not preferred widely in compositing in the film industry as compared to other tools. Um, it is not yes. Um, the, the the main reason really is uh, Adobe is layer based. So what that means is that um, the effects that you put are you put them one on top of another. Um, whereas in Nuke and Fusion and Flame you have node based, so you have effects that you kind of composite together in sort of these trees, and it makes it very easy to reuse some of the elements. So if you make a map and you want to use it again later for something else, you just draw a line from there to there and, and that's that's where we'll use it um the rotor brush itself i have used it in the past as well um and it is great um and uh, machine learning algorithms like that uh image segmentation in particular um is amazing uh, there are other things as well that people kind of talk about like deep fakes and things like that um and uh all of these will be tools that hopefully yes will make some of this uh, work a little bit easier for us um so so the question is like will rotobrush make rotoscoping easier i hope so because there are um because i have a uh, technical masters um, in computer vision as well so i have studied uh, a lot of these algorithms um and sort of you know even looking at me right now i'm, I'm being keyed out by a, by a by a depth camera this is why i can sometimes disappear but uh, but even visually if you just look at you know uh, if I compare this pixel with the pixel next to it, one of them is bright, the other one is not, that's probably an edge. So any of these kind of algorithms, yes, uh, that's what compositing is all about. And it is, it is a changing field. Um, so one example of that, something that from computer vision has come into compositing is um, um, camera tracking. So the ability to figure out how did our original camera actually move so that then we could put those planes in front of this camera, like in this robot shot that I just showed you. That used to be something that only the 3D department used to be able to do. But because computer vision and computers themselves are so much faster these days, um, all compositors can do it within their compositing software packages because it's such a common technique. It's called uh, structure promotion. Um, so if you have geometric structure and you have a moving camera, you can figure out what this geometric structure is. So. Uh, I guess my point is um, there will be more tools available, but I don't think compositing is going to go away. So, so there will be more more interesting tools to to learn, and and some of it which will make make our life more fun and more 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 exciting. I think. Is the skill set you can learn from After Effects transferable uh, to new can see that? Yes, definitely. Um, the, the the main main principles of understanding alpha channels opacities, uh, animating parameters, uh, a lot of that is is transferable. Um, sometimes we do have to slightly, when we have people with, with, with strong experience in After Effects, they have to do a little bit of unlearning first, uh, just to get their head around how it works uh, in Nuke, um, because the workflow is a little bit different. But um, but no, yeah, it, it, it definitely doesn't hurt to know to know After Effects well. Um, does knowledge of modeling help in digital matte painting? Yes, um, like I said, uh, there are departments uh, in in other uh, companies where you actually have these artists who are generalists and they do 3D and 2D. Uh, so environment artists can actually do 3D. Uh, these days, uh, Unreal, Unreal and Quixel allow you to do uh, environments using scanned elements as well. So you have lots of rocks. You don't need to model a rock these days. You can just buy a digital rock online because it's easier that way or a selection of rocks and a selection of trees and you can make an environment out of those. So uh, and that's a little bit what we were doing in this uh, shot with uh, with uh, jungle. We were using something called speed tree. So you don't, you know, we kind of we took some reference of what kind of trees we would like in the jungle, but then we populate the whole forest with them. Um, so, so yes, definitely 3D would help. Can we learn to degree course remotely? Yes, um, I can confirm with Derek, but definitely. <laughs> I should say very probably, um, but uh, but yes, um, we... I was actually going to double check that with you, Haller. <laughs> for the four year slash three year degree, I'm not sure if that's been introduced yet. For the masters, definitely. Um, yes. 
Yes, sorry, that's a very good point. Yes. Yeah, so for anyone, I know, I assume the question you're asking is about probably the degree, but for the degree, it's it's a four year integrated masters. Um, although remote teaching is happening now, I can't confirm 100% that the degree starting in September would be all with the way remote. Maybe that will be confirmed sooner. Um, but for the masters, um, we do take international students because it can be completely done remotely if you want to, if you want to be. Um, but if you don't, you can also do six months on site using a short term study visa and then do further modules at home. Um, I can give the details here of in the chat. There's, a, there's an email address there. If it is a degree you're looking at specifically, if you get in touch with info at pearsoncollege.co.uk, and then if it is about a master's, just get in touch with admissions and we can take it from there. Cool. Thanks. So there's another question. Do we have industry links to allow alumni coming from, let's say, DMP course to assist in getting work in the industry? Um, we have something called the Aftercast scheme. Um, and basically what after the scheme is, um, is we, we, we looked at your showreels after you, you study um, and then we make you even more industry ready because it is in our interest uh, for anyone who graduates from us to, to, to get a job because that makes us look better as well. Um, and, and for anyone who you know, graduates to actually be very good at what they do. Um, so that's, that's, that's in our interest. Um, we do occasionally get um, get uh, companies coming straight to us as well, asking for people uh, and asking for recent graduates, um, and then we we obviously try to try to encourage as as many of our our you know recent graduates to apply as possible within the limits of the GDPR regulations and things like that, uh, because we can't just just hand out student details to random recruiting sounding people. So <laughs> that's against the law uh, but um, but yes otherwise um, we are very connected and um, and also we have a lot of industry talks and recruiters coming to us so for undergraduate and some of the postgraduate students as well our ta talent development team they organize things called mock interviews so basically they get um, industry recruiters to come in and you can practice doing an uh, interview with uh, with an actual industry recruiter now, the good thing is um, they probably will remember you. Uh, so, so next time you go to the interview with the same person, you'll be like, oh, I, I remember you. So, so we are very connected as well. Um, we, 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 you know, we can't do direct uh, recruitment because legal reasons. And we, I think Escape, we in the historical actually used to do uh, recruitment because we were a recruitment agency as well. Uh, but these days we are purely educational. Cool. I think this is all the questions so far. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any other questions about the courses themselves, um, please email email Derek. Um, and I hope you hope you enjoyed this this um, this introduction to compositing. Uh, and definitely definitely do come back next week. Um, to learn more about compositing in TV and the week after that where I show you some cool tricks in lightning and the week after that to learn more skills uh, and then again uh, in November to do a taste of day with me as well so lots of cool stuff coming up <laughs>